Hello everyone and welcome to Biopsychology Lesson 6. In this video we're going to look at different ways of investigating the brain. And for A-level psychology there are four ways that you need to know about. You've got fMRIs, EEGs and ERPs, and then finally postmortems. So before I start, just a quick heads up, for the most part it will be fine to use the abbreviations of these methods when you're writing answers to exam questions. Up to now, exam papers have also tended to use the abbreviations rather than the full names. However, that being said, it doesn't hurt to know the full names because you don't want to get a question asking you to evaluate the use of the electroencephalogram and then not actually realize that they are talking about an EEG. Okay, so just keep that in mind when you are doing your revision. So the first method that we are going to look at is fMRIs. fMRIs are used to measure changes in brain activity while a task is being performed. And it does that by measuring changes in blood flow in a particular area of the brain. Now the idea is that when a task is being carried out, the particular area of the brain that's required for that task becomes more active. And if an area of the brain becomes more active, it needs more oxygen. So to meet that demand for oxygen, the brain increases blood flow to that area, which then delivers more oxygen via red blood cells. That change in blood flow is what the fMRI detects, and it allows researchers to map areas of the brain that are involved in a particular mental activity. And it produces an image like the one you can see on the screen, with the different colours indicating activity in different areas. A second way of investigating the brain is an EEG. EEGs measure general electrical activity in the brain, and to do that, electrodes are placed on the scalp, and these electrodes detect small electrical charges which are the result of brain activity. Now when this electrical activity is graphed over a period of time, it produces an EEG image, like the one you can see on the right of the screen. Data from EEGs can be used to detect and diagnose a whole host of disorders that affect brain activity. So for example, people with epilepsy show spikes of electrical activity, whereas people with degenerative brain diseases such as Alzheimer's show an overall slowing of electrical activity. So EEGs are really, really helpful for doctors or clinicians to actually diagnose different types of conditions. Now there are five basic EEG patterns. Again, you can see them on the right of the screen. You've got alpha, beta, delta, theta, and gamma waves. You don't really need to know too much about them for A-level psychology, but we do come across them again in lesson eight when we look at ultradian rhythms. For now, just be aware that they exist and that each EEG pattern indicates a different level of activity in the brain. Now, although EEGs have a lot of scientific and clinical applications, Realistically, in its raw form, it's very crude and it's an overly general measure of brain activity. However, hidden within the data produced by EEGs are all of the neural responses associated with specific sensory, cognitive and motor events that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And that brings us on to our next method, event-related potentials. Now, ERPs are very small voltage changes in the brain that are triggered by specific events, like the cognitive processing of a particular stimulus, such as listening to music or looking at a picture. Now, the issue with ERPs is that it's quite difficult to pick out the voltage change related to a specific event amongst all the other electrical activity in the brain. So, to establish a specific response to a specific stimulus, the stimulus has to be presented many, many, many times, and then all of the responses are averaged together. Now, in the process of doing that, it's possible to filter out all of the neural activity that isn't related to that stimulus, because it won't occur consistently, whereas the neural activity that is related to that stimulus will occur consistently. That then allows us to get rid of all of the background noise, and that will make the neural activity that we are looking for, the neural activity that's related to a particular stimulus, stand out and be easily identifiable. And our final way of investigating the brain is post-mortem examinations. Now this is a technique that involves the analysis of a person's brain following their death. Now, in research, individuals that are subjected to a post-mortem are usually those people who had a rare disorder and displayed atypical or unusual behavior, whether physical or mental behavior, whilst they were still alive. Now, the idea is 
to examine areas of damage within the brain to establish the likely cause of the unusual behavior. And in some cases, that also involves using a control group. So that would be a neurotypical brain or a brain belonging to a deceased individual that did not display any unusual behavior whilst they were still alive. Now, there are lots of examples of postmortems being carried out for research purposes. But one of the earliest examples that you may have already come across is Broca's work with his patient Tan. Now, Tan displayed speech problems whilst he was still alive. And after a post-mortem was carried out, it was discovered that Tan had damage in his left frontal lobe, an area that's now known as Broca's area. And if you remember from your localization of function lesson, Broca's area is important for speech production. So that post-mortem gave us lots of information about areas of the brain that are involved in speech. And there are some other examples on the screen for you now that aren't 150 years old that just highlight as well that postmortems still play a really important role in developing our understanding of the human brain. Okay, so let's move on to some evaluation points now. Before we do that, just a quick heads up, the evaluation points work a little bit differently for this topic. You won't be able to get away with just knowing three or four, but you should definitely aim to know at least one strength and one weakness for each of them. And the reason being is that you'll most likely be asked to outline and evaluate at least two ways of investigating the brain if you get a 16 mark essay on this topic. So if you have at least two evaluation points for each, you should be covered. However, because of that, the evaluation points are quite short when you compare them to the evaluation points from other topics. So there is a silver lining there. So fMRIs. A strength of fMRIs is that they are non-invasive. Okay, so that means that they don't rely on the use of potentially harmful radiation like PET scans, and they also don't involve inserting anything in your brain, which is a bonus. Also, fMRIs have very good spatial resolution, and that means that it produces images that depict detail by the millimeter, making it possible to get a very clear picture of how activity is localized in the brain. However, fMRIs can unfortunately only measure blood flow, and it can't home in on the exact type of activity of each individual neuron which means it can be quite difficult to tell exactly what type of activity is being shown on the screen. It just shows us where the activity is, but not what the activity is. Moving on, EEGs are invaluable in the clinical diagnosis of certain conditions such as epilepsy, which is a disorder characterized by random bursts of activity in the brain, and those random bursts of activity can easily be detected by an EEG. So let's say, for example, a patient comes in and is experiencing seizures, and the EEG will be able to help determine whether that patient has epilepsy, or if those seizures have perhaps a different origin. Now, unlike fMRIs, EEGs have very poor spatial resolution, and, it can, and they can only provide very generalized information. Electrical activity can be picked up by several neighboring electrodes, and that makes it very, very difficult to pinpoint the exact source of any activity in the brain. So researchers can't distinguish between activity originating in different but neighboring locations, which is an issue. ERPs, however, bring much more specificity to the measurement of neural processes than could ever be achieved using raw EEG data. So that's a good thing. They also, like EEGs, have excellent temporal resolution. Okay, so that means that the data is presented in real time. There's no time delay um, with EEGs or with ERPs. And those strengths have led to the widespread use of ERPs in the measurement of cognitive functions and also cognitive deficits. The downside, however, is that ERPs are very, very small, and they're very difficult to pick out from all the other electrical activity in the brain. So that means that a large number of trials often have to be conducted in order to gain meaningful data, which takes time and costs money. Um, and it also limits the type of questions that ERP readings can realistically answer. So they're only useful for certain things. And then finally, we come to postmortems. Postmortems allow for a much more detailed examination of anatomical and neurochemical elements of the brain, which wouldn't be possible with less invasive methods such as fMRIs and EEGs. 
they really let you get down and dirty with the brain and let you explore regions that would otherwise be completely inaccessible to you. And because of that, postmortems have really deepened our understanding of certain disorders such as schizophrenia, because they've provided evidence for structural anomalies and changes to neurotransmitter systems which are both associated with the disorder. However, Unfortunately, people die in a variety of different circumstances and at varying stages of disease, both of which could affect the post-mortem brain. Also, things like drug treatments, age at the time of death, and also the time between death and the post-mortem can affect the brain and act as a confounding variable. And that means that the observed damage to the brain may not actually be linked to the behavior that's being reviewed, or at best, it could paint an incorrect picture. Okay, so there are quite a few confounding variables when it comes to postmortems. Okay, that's the end of the evaluation bits. Obviously, depending on which book you're using, there are going to be more evaluation points that you can use. I've just given you one or two per way of investigating the brain. If you want to get any more, then feel free to use your book and do that. So before we finish off, then just a couple of exam questions. As with most of the topics in psychology, you've got the same sort of standard questions. This topic hasn't come up very often yet in exams, so there's still only a small amount of examples to choose from. But in general, you've got your multiple choice questions, which are fairly standard at the top there. You've got your short answer questions, which could be evaluation questions, they could be comparison questions, or they could just quite simply ask you to outline the use of a particular way of investigating the brain. Either way, it could be anywhere between two and six marks, so make sure you know enough detail um, to answer a six mark question. And then finally, you've obviously got your essays as well. Now on the screen, you've got an eight mark essay, which is why you're given the option to only talk about one way of investigating the brain. However, if you were to get a 16 marker, you can be almost certain that you'll be asked to outline and evaluate two or more ways. Okay, so just keep that in mind as well. So I'm going to leave it there. If you have any questions, please pop them in the comments section below and I will get back to you as soon as I can. I hope it's all made sense and I hope it has been useful. Thank you very much for listening.